Matt and Murr are back together. We're talking Once about again. the state of short fiction. It is after Worldcon 2022, and it is the Ditch Diggers. Ditch Diggers appear, and ain't no one of these here. With some not so nice advice for your writing career, to be clear. No punches will be pulled, but the punch may be spiked. How they like before they get on the mic. To my left, we got the mighty Murr Lafferty. And if I piss her off, believe me, she'll come after me. And her co-host, Matt Evan Wallace, on the right. Yes, she may be half as hype as she can take him in a fight. So settle in, folks, buckle in and boot up. Time to meddle in a way to make your writer shut up. It's hard work, but the perk is that it's fun and exciting. Facebook will still be there when you're done writing. Ditch Diggers! Yes, that fun post Worldcon time. Yeah. Even more interesting in in these dicey times of ours. I'm and, not, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. No, I mean, I you know, I follow, I didn't go because I don't go to conventions anymore. And, yeah, you too uh, good for that. I'm not too good for it. I just don't want to get COVID. <laughs> like I don't know what else to say. It like that's the reason yeah. you don't go to conventions anymore. That's one of the primary reasons. Yeah. Are okay. you saying that? What is it like? You're saying that like it's a weird thing. I don't know. No, I just thought you decided that well before COVID. No, I decided I didn't like conventions well before COVID. I COVID really cinched me not going anymore. Yeah. Because um, I just don't feel the return is worth the magnificent investment that you know you have to put out for these things, which is a whole other topic for a whole other show. But yeah, no, yeah. COVID for the last for the last two and a half to three years has been has been the primary reason. I still. I still have massive amounts of anxiety when I see photos from conventions at this point. So I just can't even imagine uh, going to one. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. All of my photos from Worldcon, they should all be masked. If they're not masked, then I was outside. Um, no, I know you take things seriously. And I know yeah. there are conventions that, you know, as a really take things seriously. It's just as seriously as you can take things and all the protocols you can put in place, you're still dealing with people who are inherently shitty. So <laughs> you're going to get groups and individuals who just don't give a shit. And there's just nothing you can do about that. And yeah. it's that X factor that really keeps me away from the conventions. It's not yes. a knock on folks who need or want to attend or conventions who are doing their best with the safety protocols. It's just, mm -hmm. this yeah. is not for me. So, but I'm just, I, I only, I only put that out there to add that just added the whole other dimension to the whole Worldcon viewing from the outside experience this year. Sure. Is, is what I'm saying. Gotcha. You know? yeah. Well, to uh, to properly start the podcast, this is the Ditch Diggers. I am Mer Lafferty, and I'm here with Matt Wallace, my good and dear friend of many years. We're both science many fiction years. professionals, and we're here to talk about the business of science fiction. Um, I have a little bit to announce before we get into the nitty gritty because lots of things are happening right now. First off, <laughs> something's not happening. I had, speaking of conventions, I had plans, uh, had hopes to go to New York Comic Con, had plans to speak at She Podcasts Live in Washington, D.C. in October. Both of those things are not happening. Um, oh, I could only get a signing at New York Comic Con and considering how much it would cost me to travel to New York and put up lodging in New York. And I think even even a pro pass to Comic-Con costs money. Um, it just wasn't worth it just for a signing and to expose myself to all of that. Because even though I'm boosted, it's going to take about six weeks to actually... Six weeks, right? It takes a while. Anyway, um, <laughs> so my October is really freed up and I'm not thrilled about that because I had plans for DC especially. Um Secondly, we are doing a uh, Station Eternity sort of live table read of the first uh, three chapters or so of the book. I turned it into an audio drama. I got some awesome. live streaming and voice acting and improv friends to fill in the uh, main characters. And we're just kind of doing a live audio drama on October 1st here on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Mighty Mer for those of you listening later. And um, that'll be October 2nd, 2022, if you're listening in later years. Sorry you missed it, but it should still be on YouTube. So check that out. But uh, that should be fun. I got the idea from uh, the Princess Bride table read back in 2020. 
And I love oh, that yeah. so much. I really wanted to do something like that because people aren't doing stuff like that. They're not doing like live audio dramas where there's not actually cosplay or or you actually see the. I think there's something cool about watching a radio drama. Maybe I'm strange. I don't know. No, I agree. But I like the I like the stripped down feeling of it. It's like you know, like Mandy Patinkin yes. audio drama. You know, they're kind of like, I'm barefoot and in a little black t-shirt, but I'm doing some really cool art in front of you live, you know? Exactly. Um, so, yeah, that's October 1st. And then the book comes out October 4th. Woohoo! It was just named one of BuzzFeed's most anticipated science fiction books for the fall. I mean, come on. So of course it is. that's exciting. That's very exciting. Congratulations, um, Mark. And had some people come up to me at Worldcon saying they'd read advanced copies and liked it. Big relief. And, I like um, it. I mean, I don't know if I count. But you, I, of course I you count, dude. But you, are, but you are biased. So yeah, it's, and true. I know you wouldn't say that if you didn't like it. You'd be all like nice and supportive, but you wouldn't lie to me. But other people yeah. don't know that. They just see that we're like close friends and think that, right. you know, Matt's just like pumping her up. But no, no, I know that. And I appreciate it. No, well, yeah. No, it's absolutely true. I wouldn't say I, I liked it. I would just, I would hype the book as an event. I just wouldn't talk about the content of the book itself. Yeah. But I really like the book itself. It's very cool and weird. And I think kind of the next level for your fiction, in my humble opinion. Thank you, dude. That's very sweet. You continue uh, to evolve, Mer. And I dig that about you. Yeah, I got a really ambitious idea that's going to br either break my brain or, or change the face of science fiction forever. I like it. Go for broke, man. Those are the only two options. Either yeah. break your brain or you're just drooling pace 24-7 or you change the whole game. You change everything. Yeah, yeah. It's an, e it's an epoch. It's a merge-driven singularity slash epoch slash epoch. something else. That's, you know, very revolutionary. <laughs> Something else. I don't know. I was trying to, I, I'm doing my best over here. But no, that's really cool, man. I, that excites me just to hear that you have that kind of idea. Yeah. Not even knowing what the idea is. I'll tell you about it off stream. Cool. I know. I want to know. I absolutely want to know. But um, yeah, that, that's what's going on with me. There's a lot of stuff, uh, but it's, it's an exciting month. So we're gearing up for my first original book launch in like six years or five Dude. years. It's little bit little bit tense but uh anyway it is it's you know again difficult times still difficult times to be doing those things so yeah I, I commend you and uh just got back from Worldcon, lost two hugos but had a really good time seemed to be covid free recovered from my covid vaccine so uh good deal. that's did that's... we win a hugo dude we haven't been nominated in several years so no then no Oh, okay. And our write and our write in campaigns just keep <laughs> failing. <laughs> Whatever, man. We have one. We're I good. Know. I know. Yeah. So what um, about you? What have you been up to? Um, I'm I'm grinding, man. I don't really have anything to announce right now other than all the books I have out already that already feel, that already feel um like a past tense kind of thing. But no, you know, I'm working on I've got new stuff coming up. I've got a new middle grade book that hasn't been announced yet that will oh, be coming man. out sometime next year. I keep waiting for you to announce that. Yeah, I know. I keep waiting for the new announcement, but you know, things these, the wheels turn slowly. And then you know, I've got the final Savage book, which is in like I, I finished the writing of right now, and we're in kind of like the final edits on that. But there's no like official release date or anything going there yet, so I'm still you know we're in a holding pattern on that. And then, you know, I'm working on this amazing top secret, you know, video game project that's going to be years before any of you hear about it. But it's like, it's so wickedly cool and huge and epic. I wish I wish I could share things. But mm -hmm. that's, that's the nature of video games. You sign a contract that says if you say anything about the video game, that they come and kill you and your whole family. I that's think right. It's what's, it's what's in the clause. <clears throat> well, you know what I can say, though? And I, I'm allowed to say this. I know yeah. I am allowed to say this. Um they had, uh, what was it, PAX West or, yes. or Gamescom or whatever PAX the huge, West. PAX West, whatever the video game thing is. And they interviewed uh, Matt Booty, who was the head of Xbox Studios. Okay. Big muckety muck there. Muckety and muck. He had, big muckety muck. Big time muckety muck. As, as much muck as you could muckety, this dude muckety's that much muck at Xbox Studios. <laughs> Um, I'm really proud that I pulled that off, man. I actually think I said that correctly for you what did. I was going for. You absolutely did. That was some, that that was some impressive. high level yeah. improv shit. No, but anyway, Matt Booty, head of Xbox, doesn't get bigger than that in terms of Xbox. 
And he was running down because, you know, Microsoft owns all these different game development studios, uh, including a studio called the Exile Entertainment. And Matt Booty was running down all the games everybody's working on and all this exciting stuff everybody's doing. But Matt Booty said he was most excited for a thing called Project Cobalt that is being worked on by an Exile Entertainment. Wow. And I may or may not be involved with that project. That is super exciting, dude. So that was put out there by Matt Booty. I feel like then I feel like I can comment on it without without upsetting anybody or violating yeah. any, any yeah. concern with that. So most excited, Merck. His words. I know. I know that's so, that's super exciting, dude. But again, it's gonna be years before you actually hear any details about this. So that's you know, I'm kind of in that nebulous place of just grinding. Yeah. Things are on the horizon, I'm working on them, but I don't have anything I don't have any big exciting events to announce yet. We'll probably uh, all, yeah. We'll probably all be dead by the time it comes out, the way some probably. of these things go. That would that would be the irony. We'll finish the game and I'll finish all these books and we'll be ready to release them and that's when, you know, COVID ninety seven comes out and kills everybody. Uh. So yeah, that, that would be the because the world revolves around me, Mer. That's yeah. I like you like how you like how I made that all by myself. The oh, whole yeah. world ending totally, and the real the real tragedy is you didn't get to play a fucking video game that I worked on. That's, That's right. the real tragedy. Of this That's right. Because we're all uh, malignant narcissists in this business. I just I, I just reread the uh, Agatha Christie book where um, they discover that one of the first murders was actually just a guy trying out something, and it and and anybody in the room could have died. It's just basically he put some poison out there just to see if he could kill somebody. Right. And and someone's like, I just realized that could have been me. And her Poirot <laughs> says, no, I just thought of something worse. It could have been me. Yeah, that's I, I remember that line as soon as you started saying that. That's yeah. so good. So, um, so yeah. unfortunately, Preemie has said that she can only stay for the first half and to front load with the wisdom. And we're not doing that. So, uh, for Preemie's sake, we do need to get going with the wisdom, dude. Oh, the wisdom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so I read, uh, so we're segueing into, like, the actual show part of the show now, right? Yeah, yeah, go, man. Go swag, go swag yeah, no, way? There swag, swag way. Swag way? Smuckety muck? I'm going to, I'm going to say, I'm going to blame the, the vaccine for any sort of vocal tics. I think, that, I think that's fair. Vaccine, the anxiety of living in an unacknowledged pandemic, like, either one really works. Um... No, but I read a tweet this morning, Mer, because, you know, I, I check the Twitters. Yeah, I'm on you the check Twitters. The, you're on the Twitters. I'm actually not on the Twitters much, but I have been on the Twitters a little bit more in the past couple of days. I'm proud of myself. Go, I you was, checked the Twitters. I, I was prouder of you when you weren't on the Twitters, because you're much smarter than the rest of us. But no, so I read a tweet by uh, Diabolical Plots, which oh, yeah. is a very very cool, Nebula-winning, Hugo-nominated uh, fiction zine, Ignite-nominated fiction zine. Want to give the shout out uh, to them for because zines need love, and we're going to get into that too. But no, there was mm -hmm. a tweet. They were tweeting about uh, an unnamed publication's uh, guidelines for submitting stories, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess in the guidelines, and here I, I will read it <clears throat> so I don't misquote: uh, authors who submit to us more than four to five times without an acceptance are asked to revisit our previous issues and consider goodness of fit before submitting again. And uh, the person tweeting for Diabolical Plots obviously had a bit of an issue with this. It, it <laughs> rubbed them, them a little wrong way. And I mean, and they had Diabolical Plots acknowledged it. Yes, you should consider fit, but that this specific guideline seemed very much intended to discourage people. And when you're dealing with people submitting short fiction, I don't think it's unfair or unkind in any way to say you're dealing with people who have a pretty high anxiety quotient already among them. It's, yeah, a, it's a create it's a creative uh, problem. Yeah. More people with who are really creative have this kind of issue than not. And you know, if you don't have it when you start doing this, you certainly develop it over time, dealing with so many rejections, which is an inevitable uh, kind of symptom of yeah. trying to enter this industry and try to you know get stories published. Like you deal with an enormous amount of rejection. And Diabolical Plots, a very astute point, was if you demand that a person with anxiety only submit to places where they're sure their work is a perfect fit, whatever the hell that means, uh, that person probably just won't submit anywhere, you yeah. know? And that getting rejected a few times, and I would add, this wasn't in Diabol Diabolical Plots tweet, but I would add more than a few times. Uh, it's, just, uh, it's just a matter of, you know, math. It doesn't mean your work is terrible. It doesn't mean you should be discouraged or stop. You know. No, and it just pisses this, me yeah. off because I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 please. You're pissed off. The, the, this thing pisses me off because I've been talking for 17 years, <laughs> and I should be writing. 
that rejection's okay. Nay, it should be celebrated because it is part of being a working writer. And then some asshole comes along with a statement like that and can just, like, erase all of my hard work. And yes, I'm making it about me instead of other writers (laughs) and anxiety. But the deal is... Make it about you, Mer. Make it about you. I try really hard to tell people that the majority of what holds you back in your writing career is your own emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to overcome. Because if it's just like a matter of lifting a weight every day to get stronger, you can do that. But it's a matter of getting better as a writer, but also being willing to sit down and write again after being rejected. And being willing to send that story out to a different publication after it's been rejected. That's all an emotional decision. That's not, that's not just business. And uh, that's why, you know, that's what I talk about and I should be writing. And you just come across and say, well, you know, if you've been rejected a couple of times, then clearly you're not a fit. No, no, that is okay. Maybe you're not a fit for them and you should never send to them again. Because that sounds like a real asshole move. If you, you is, clearly yeah. don't know anything about writers, if you're going to ask for that. Now, granted, yeah. if you have, if you're sending hard fantasy to an SF publication, maybe pay attention to submission guidelines. Yeah, if you're, no one's, yeah. If no one's you're saying sending, don't pay like, submission, don't pay attention to submission guidelines. Right. If you're saying, sending super yeah. bleak shit to unidentified funny objects, maybe look at the submission guidelines. But. If you read the submission guidelines and you think your story might be a fit, then send it. And just anybody's, you know, for me, it's like the more often you submit, the more editors will know your name and they might take a look at, you know, what they might start to notice your name and see that you're getting better. And then surprise, surprise. Editors are rooting for you. They want good stories. They want uh-huh. you to. They want you to send them a great story, and they're thrilled to buy it. And so, if they, if if like we get like six stories in a row from a person, and like the sixth one's really good, I'm gonna be like even happier to publish them because I know that they've been working hard. That's what Absolutely. the five rejections tell me. That they've been working hard and getting better, and now I can say, you know, I've been watching you grow, and that's awesome. No, I mean, you hit the nail right on the head there. It's like authors develop, man. They get better. You know, they they get different. They write different things. Yeah. Um, and even, you know, and even if it isn't if it's different stories that you're submitting over time, and develop, like there was a – someone responded to the tweet I mentioned. I can't find it because I'm sad I don't remember who it is. But they were talking about how – their their dream market it took them i think it was like you know five years or something like that and like 20 different stories to crack finally yeah but they finally cracked it like that's par for the course when you do this which is a little sad but ultimately triumphant i would hope it's not sad that you're ha- it's just you know to, that it takes that long to kind of get your your thing out there um but you know that's that's the whole point man is like you keep at it you have to persistence is the only way to win in this thing. Like you, you never get the winning lottery ticket. You never write the one story or the one book that cracks everything. And you're the, you're the fabled overnight success. Like 99.999% of the time it's submitting and getting rejected and submitting and rinse and repeat over and over again until you want to smash your skull against a wall, but you keep going. And then eventually you crack through somewhere and that's what starts the whole ball rolling on an actual career. You know, like that's the only way to do it. So, and you know, I try to, I try, you know, because empathy is like my big thing these days because I wasn't always the most empathetic person in the world. I admit that. You've grown. I, I, I I admire that about you. I thank you. Um, Not, you know, not looking for cookies, but I'm trying. I know. I'm I'm just acknowledging. I've known you long enough to see you evolve. It's it's been awesome. I appreciate that. But anyway, so I try to see it from. Like slush reading and running any any fiction market is very hard work and yep. generally thankless work. And one of the reasons I responded so strongly to the, this tweet when I saw it is because I've been thinking a lot about short fiction and short fiction authors and short fiction markets lately because it's kind of an ongoing struggle and problem, you know, within the industry and within kind of the creative side uh, too. Just like the thinning of places to submit and how hard it is to run 
a magazine, let alone make any kind of sustainable money doing it. So this is just something hit me where I live. And like, I try to like, and I know you know all about it because you're an editor for many, many years of many, many markets. And it's a hard thing to do. So I try to see it from the point of view of like, I get that it, I get that you get a lot of stories when you run a market and, and slush is hard and editing is hard. Running the zine is hard. But I just think you have to weigh that against the message you're sending out and what you're contributing to the culture when you tell writers something <laughs> like if we reject you four to five times, you're probably the problem. You know, yeah. I just think that I think that's a step too far and maybe more than whoever wrote these guidelines intended. Like their intentions may have been very pure in their own mind from the perspective of we're trying to save us and you time and make this more efficient. But I think they just kind of, they kind of lost the plot a little bit with what's best for a healthy, both a healthy market and a healthy relationship with writers and the message that your particular market is sending out to writers and your, and your audience as well, you know? So if they meant, they probably (sighs) meant look at the submission guidelines, but they didn't say that. Yeah. And you can really, really take what they're saying as we're just we're creative obsessive anxiety people we are going to take what is said and take it to the absolute worst place we can logically which is if you don't sell to us in five stories you're not a good fit go away little writer yeah and And that's not if that's what they mean then they're assholes and you should not submit to them ever first, last, or any of your stories. They don't deserve your stories. No, I, I agree If with it's that. not what they meant, they need to get writers on staff because clearly they're not making themselves understood. Yeah. And, to, and again, like, that could be a very deeply systemic thing with that publication and just there's somebody you don't want to deal with. That also could have been someone who, like, read one story that day from someone that just doesn't read their guidelines and then just decided to make this you know, general blanket statement that was very ill-advised. I don't know. But, like, it's one of those things that they don't address and fix. It's not a market I would certainly recommend to people to submit to as writers for all those reasons. But, uh, yeah. But then again, and then, you know, to kind of springboard off this into the larger issue of short fiction, short fiction markets, it's tough, man, because, you know, there there are markets out there, but it's, it's not like... It's writers talk about all the time is it's there's only so many markets you can submit to or or they feel like their work is appropriate for it. Right. So it's almost like you're already dealing with an audience that's that's stretching to like wanting to try to submit to your market, even though you might not be the most welcoming like this publication we're talking about right now. You know, I guess I'm talking about the pressure writers feel with kind of the shrinking, the whole shrinking, you know, dichotomy of short fiction markets in general to be like, well, you know, I've heard this market doesn't treat people particularly well, but I've been rejected by these other markets, so maybe I should just suck it up and submit to them anyway. Like, that kind of thought process, you know? Yeah. And that, it makes me sad to think about that, because, like, it shouldn't be that way. It really just discourages writers and discourages creativity, discourages us finding our, our best work. And, like, short fiction is and, and should be, and I hope always will be, such a fertile ground for amazing fiction voices, you know? And yeah. it just, I feel like it just progressively is shrinking and getting crapped on and just, you know, getting a really raw deal from most people. And I don't really know what to do about that, but it's an issue. Well, we, we have a podcast that we try to talk about. So. We do, you know, and again, we contribute as we're able, but like our audience is not, you know, like millions of people worldwide. We do what we can, but it's just, and everybody does what they can. That's the thing. I don't want to turn this into a, a scold session to telling people you're not doing enough to support Short fiction markets. We're all doing the best we can with the time and the platform and the energy that we're allotted in this life. You know, it's not about that. It's just, I just don't know systemically what the answer is. Just, I know not enough people are willing to pay for short fiction and short fiction markets. Like, that's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, you would like to believe the audience is there if it could be harnessed and focused in the right way. But that's always the problem with making money on any kind of. I'm very hesitant to use the word content online, but any kind of, you know, art or media right. online is figuring out in this day and age of people being willing to take anything digitally that isn't nailed down for free and not consider it theft and just being totally fine with that relationship to work. Like it's very hard to get anybody to pay for anything, um, you know, in a digital medium. 
uh, let alone a print medium. I don't even know if print is still a thing at this point. Uh, I think there's print things. I like prints. It's just, you know, it's hard, man. It's, we, it's, that's the place we've come to. You see, so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because we've been doing this so long. And I think that's one thing I can speak for you, Mer. We've both been doing this a very long time. I don't feel it's an unreasonable statement. That we've seen so many shifts in, in models and paradigms and delivery methods and technology and market. And it's, you know, I think so many magazines that were so prevalent when I started submitting short fiction, you know, 17, 20 years ago, whatever the hell it was now. Um, that either don't exist anymore, or if they exist, they've stopped doing print entirely and have shifted completely to an online model, or yeah. they're just they're totally unrecognizable from when I might have had a story in them, you know, a million years ago, and it was in a physical magazine, and I went to Barnes and Noble and bought the physical magazine. That's just yeah. not a thing anymore. I had very few physical magazine <clears throat> stories. Not that I did a whole lot of short stories anyway. I'm trying to write a short story now, and it's just like letting a balloon go in a room. It's just kind of all <laughs> over the place. Not real happy with it, but... Uh, that should be the title, Letting a Balloon Go in the Room. Okay. It's very it's deep. It's metaphor. It's it is. It is. It's metaphorical. I'm writing that down right now. But yeah, so short fiction's not easy. Um, also, no, it's very, I think, very hard. Yeah. I think a lot of my ideas these days go toward novel length ideas, but uh, trying to focus on a short story idea is it's a challenge and it very much is. i you know when i started out all i did was short stories mm -hmm. i started I, I started out my career doing a short story podcast of my own that's how all of this started for me and i always considered my i, I still tend towards shorter ideas but like i haven't written any short story in years like it's pretty much a not that's what's interesting to me watching because i feel like i'm kind of watching all of this sort of from the outside like i don't mm -hmm. really have a dog in the race at this point. I don't write short fiction. I'm just a reader of short fiction. I'm a fan of short fiction. I, and I really look at it from that kind of viewpoint. Um, I miss doing it. And I, it's given me a deeper appreciation of people who are doing it now and doing it so well. And even I fall into that pitfall sometimes of thinking of short fiction as like a training ground for novelists, right? Which, I mean, it's not that that, that isn't a thing or shouldn't be a thing, but when people talk about it like that, I feel it's very minimizing the short fiction as its own form, you know? Because I like short stories as their own thing. And, like, you know, they're, it's just sad that you can have a really brilliant writer of short stories and even a really brilliant prolific writer of short stories, but there's no real mechanism for them to make any kind of living or any kind of significant income from that form anymore. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Oh, yeah. So, you know, and money is time, man. That's we, we talk about that all, all a lot on the show. It's like, if you don't have the money, you don't have the resources, you don't have the time to devote to your art and your craft. And the fact that the, somebody who is only writing short stories, uh, you know, is is relegated to dealing with whatever time they can get, having to, having to support themselves all these other ways because they're never going to make the money from that. It's just, it's sad to me. And I feel like we miss out on a lot of work we would have, otherwise gotten and i think about that and that's what that's what makes me sad there's no the diminishing appreciation for it as its own form and the complete non-existence of it as any kind of commercial entity anymore it's just very it's just very sad to me because i love short stories and i love short story writers yeah just just as a fan you know it's not even a profession i'm not even lamenting for me like oh i can't make money writing a short story like i'm kind of beyond that i do novels i do video games that's my gig right now and i'm happy with that i just like reading short stories so I don't know what to do about it, man. I mean, like we talked about the money is a big problem. <clears throat> Promotion is a big problem. Just making, like with anything fiction related, making people aware you're doing what you're doing is a huge problem. Yeah. Uh, of course, I, there's you know. like making people care that it's actually a skill. <laughs> there's still that. Yeah. There's people who think that if they can tell a story about something funny that happened when they got drunk last weekend, that <laughs> means that they can tell a story with the beginning, middle, and end and characters you care about on paper um, because yeah, they're you know, words. It's like that old expression, uh, you ought to send that one in to Reader's Digest. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, you shouldn't, jackass, because <laughs> that was just some nonsense you spat it out. You'd actually have to write it down, craft it, and that's a skill unto itself. And, yeah. Well, no, but, it's, it's, it's like instead of, hey, I got this idea, you should you should write it and we could both be rich. I'm like, no, you write it. You get all the money. <laughs> There you go. 
It sounds like a cliche to a lot of people. People don't understand how real a thing that is and how often that happens out in the world when you talk to people about writing or being a writer. Um, every cab driver, I don't mean to single out cab drivers, added to which this is the last time you were, anybody was in a fucking cab at this point. Uh, Uber has, driver. You know, Uber driver same will tell thing. you. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've, got, I've got an idea. It's not the same thing. I've got an idea for a short story. I've got an idea for a story. You write it, we'll go have it. I've gone to a it. dark place. I'm sorry. No, that's a whole, di- again, much like the con thing, that's a whole different episode, but it's fine. Um, yeah, they were like, I've got this idea. You write it, we'll go halves, we'll make millions. You and me, kid. And it's like, no, I, you know, I have, I had five ideas before breakfast this morning. Ideas are meaningless. Everybody mm-hmm. has ideas. Like, it's the actual turning of them into words. And a thing. So, yeah, I mean, that's, and that's the thing with writing in general. It gets very devalued. So, you know, if, that, if like writing that you perceive as being the kind of writing that makes money is so devalued, think of how devalued short fiction is, which is, you know, as and as an as an industry like commodity, even even like below all that stuff, like you don't have a chance, and it just really sucks. You know, I I feel like I barely see short story collections anymore. I know people still do them, and I always get excited when I see one, but mm-hmm. it's not it's certainly not as prevalent as it once was. You yeah. know, and that makes me really sad. And uh, yeah, man, I don't I don't know what the answer is, Mark, but it's something that that needs to be addressed in some form or fashion. Yeah, I always wonder what editors expect when they do um anthologies like what kind of sales expectations because i almost always hear that sales on anthologies were not what expected and i'm thinking if i always hear that shouldn't they scale the expectations down a little bit right yeah Um, i mean no that's that no that's a really that's that is an incredibly valid point that goes to a lot of i was just um I was having a discussion with somebody the other day, I forget who, about uh, the trouble with a lot of, um, you know, hardcover debut uh, releases, like the insistence on the hardcover debut in a lot of genres and how detrimental that can absolutely be to a writer's career, like starting them off with, it's it almost becomes like, you know, a handicap at this point. Is handicap an okay word to use? Actually, I actually don't know in that context. But it just starting them off at a detriment because you're already setting this really high price point which sets this really high expectation. Whereas if, you know, you started off with a, with a smaller paperback cover debut and gave it a chance to grow, it'd be so much better for so many authors, especially right now when debuts are so difficult. Yeah. I think, I think that's probably, you know, when you, when you get your first deal, if you get your first deal and it's modest and it's um, paperback, it can be disappointing. And then you realize that since expectations are low, they're easier to exceed. Yeah, and, and you know, I am actually in retrospect, I'm happier that my career started out like that, and I'm even happy that my first two books did not do as well as they expected. So my next deal, which was Six Wakes, was even worse. If they could have gone somewhere beyond paperback, they would have. <laughs> you know, if they oh, were just doing ebook, they they probably would have, but they didn't. It was paperback, and then that one did right. really well and earned out really quick because the advance was really low but yeah. uh you know that that looked a lot better than than maybe not hitting trying to get a, a hardcover and do amazingly on it um and i still don't have a hardcover and i'm not counting the ip books um i mean dude i've had <laughs> i've had three of them they haven't gone well I'll just be honest with you. They they haven't. I in retrospect, um, I wish I wish all three of the ones that I've had uh, had been paperback uh, originals instead. I think we could have done better. But it's you know it's the thing, man. It's like it's a hell of a thing when you feel like all right, we're gonna swing for the fences on this one. You mm-hmm. get really excited about that. Like the money is bigger up front, but then again, but then the expectations are bigger up front. Yeah, and it's great when you can nail that. But the truth is, in this industry, and the math bears it. Most of the time, you're not going to nail that. You're just not. Like, that's just the reality of sales when it comes to publishing. So, you know, you've got, I don't, I don't know what the exact numbers would be, but if it was like one in a hundred or one in a thousand or whatever, I, I don't know what it would be, but it's just like, your odds are just much better. So, I don't know where, I don't know if we got kind of off topic. You were talking about anthologies, right? That was how we Yeah, but I mean, I yeah. think going into paperback versus hardcover is a legitimate <clears throat> topic. It's, yeah, it's, and yeah. it's, and it's, is it, Actually, I don't know the answer to this. Do agents have any hand in this? I know they sometimes want to push for something bigger, but 
Uh, do they ever actually listen? <laughs> does, uh, no, does publishing they... and listen to agents when it comes to paperbacks or versus hardcovers? I, I that I don't I don't think so. That that is that is you're kind of relegated to the model the publisher has and the and the model sort of the genre you're in has. Like with middle grade, like and the publisher that the publisher I work with, hard that hardcover release is a debut, and then the paperback a year later is like that's that's standard, that's standard operating procedure for mm-hmm. a few things, and that's not going to change, you know, based on based on what you want. Um, you know, I mean, agents, smart agents, I think when it comes to like advances and stuff, they do take that into consideration. There play there are plenty of agents who I've seen espouse theories like. For a lot of my clients, I feel like a lower advance is actually a better thing long term for their career yeah. in certain situations. And I appreciate that kind of thinking because it's that kind of long term strategic thinking, because I think that can be lacking for a lot of agents and authors, too. You know, you tend to think of a book as its own thing. And we're just again, we're going to swing for the fences on this. We're going to get as much as we can and try to push it out there as hard as we can. Mm-hmm. You know, taking a step back from that. I appreciate people taking a step back from that and go, well, wait, you know, let's look at the market. Let's look at, you know, the times we're living in right now. Maybe it'd be better to scale it down a bit. You're British, so scale it down a bit. That's an Eddie Izzard reference. Um, but yeah, so when it comes to circling back, when it comes to short fiction collections or anthologies, I do think it's doubly important to take that kind of long view and that kind of not lower bar, but just realistic expectations. So I, I, you know, doing a hardcover, doing a big hardcover anthology at this point, I'm almost, I don't, almost don't understand why you would do that unless you had just giant selling names in it, you know, to me, that's just, that's just setting yourself up for failure. So yeah, I guess that is, you know, that, that those are practical things that could be looked at and can be addressed to try to help, but just beyond that systemically, I, I, I take a very dim view of the whole thing and it makes me sad. Actually, I don't think my old publisher, Orbit, ha- does any hardcovers because N.K. Jemison's books were paperback and James S.A. Corey's books are paperback. Mm-hmm. That's um, true. And those are the, the huge, The Expanse and The Fifth Season. Those are huge sellers. So Yeah. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. And you can always do one later. You know, F- Fonda Lee, I believe, she had... They did the, the some of the Jade books in paperback, and because they sold so well, they came back and did them hardcover. Yeah, I think they you know, did the whole no... slipcase fancy thing. Yeah, and yeah. they should because their series is fucking brilliant. And like, but that's the thing. It's like I would rather that's such a better scenario than we led with the big hardcover. Yeah, and it didn't meet our expectations, so the rest of your series is fucked. You know, like that's that's a much more common and sadder scenario. But yeah. And when, but the point is, when you look at it like that, when you look at it like, there's no reason you can't do the hardcover release later. Like, why lead with it, especially for an unknown debut author? It just doesn't really make any sense when you, when you look at it that way. Unless the publisher is just going to put massive promotion behind it, which again, 99.9% of the time is not going to happen. Anything no. close to it is not going to happen. So it's just such mm-hmm. backwards, it's just such backwards thinking. And it does, and it does apply to what we're talking about here. It's, with short fiction, uh, your your expectations have to be set even more reasonably, and reasonably is a kind word there. So I don't know, but I love anthologies and I love collections, and I'd love to see them become as prevalent as I feel like they were when I was, you know, a kid reading science fiction and fantasy. So they're just they're not as much out there. I'm like surprised when an uh, when an author announces a short story collection at this point. Yeah, I'm always like, oh man, they still do that. That's awesome. I'm totally yeah. gonna get that. Cameron Hurley like just terrific. came out with one. Yeah, no, Cameron Hurley, um, Cassandra Kaw uh, has or is Ooh, hers, cool. everyone. Um, uh, uh, Malcolm Older, I think, has is has one coming out. Like they're okay. out there. Uh, but again, like you don't. Again, you don't. Me saying that is I, I know because I follow these authors and I'm friends with some of them and I'm excited about it. But general public wise, who's who's going to know? Like it's yeah. just not. It's not a priority even amongst the publisher to, to push that kind of stuff. And that's therein lies the, the issue with it. But I feel like if that was more of a thing, it would be good for short fiction markets in general. So I feel like you just you, you kind of detrain the audience to look for or expect or incorporate short fiction into their reading when you don't feature it prominently in books like that, you know? Yeah. I think uh, another thing, the, 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 the concept of, you know, we, we are just a, a more, more, more society. And... You know, you hear 
are you going to write more in this world? Are you going to write, are you going to turn this short story into a novel? Are you going to do a a follow-up to this novel, et cetera, et cetera? You hear this all the time. And so I think that makes some people devalue short stories because they're just like, well, if it's just like going to be five pages, why should I invest my emotions if I'm not going to get like a whole bunch more about these people? No, that is why I think that's a brilliant point. That's 100% a cultural thing, particularly in America, particularly in America that we have. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I see plenty of people. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. I just <laughs> looked out my window and one of my sprinklers just disintegrated and has become a geyser. Okay. Um, sorry. That's say you do live streams. That's a uh, that's a thing that happens. That's what you get. Anyway, that's what you get. You get it raw and filtered, uh, straight from the cut. Um, the hell was I saying? Yeah, the the thing you're talking about. Um, I see people screaming all the time, authors and agents and, and even editors, like, I want to see more standalone books. You know, let's do one book instead of a seven book series. That would be awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like even, but even if people scream that, they don't apply it to short stories. They still have that idea of like, oh man, you're a really brilliant short story author. When are you going to do your novel? You know, yeah. is like, that's the expectation. So yeah. even, I, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But my point basically is even folks who take that idea of like, we don't need more of everything. Standalone is very good. They're still not applying it to short fiction as its own form and recognizing it. And that, that is a huge issue. Well, I just had a signing at Worldcon, and I had a lot of people coming through asking if I was going to do any more Shambling Guides books. My last Shambling Guide book came out eight years ago. And right. they're asking if I'm, if I'm going to do more Six Wakes books. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is the publisher's decision. Um... So not right now. Um, And yes, self pub is a thing. However, when I have a, uh, when I have a contract in hand that pays me money for a book and I have fans that want a book that didn't sell very well, Uh a a follow-up to a book that didn't sell well enough for the publisher to continue the series and knowing all of the work, including editing cover design interior design is all on me i you know i'm gonna go for the contract yeah it's not worth it man that's just the truth like i I, yeah again i've been doing this a long time i know what my sales are i know what my current audience is i know what my reach is with my platforms which is the only thing i can control and in terms of self-publishing would be my only major method of pushing stuff and that's the reason I don't have a Patreon and I haven't kickstarted stuff like that because it just wouldn't, it wouldn't do well enough. Like I'm not, I'm not there uh, audience wise and it wouldn't be worth it for me. It's much better for me to take a contract uh, with guaranteed money and some kind of semblance of resources behind it that are not my own or beyond my own. Even though, again, that's a whole other discussion when we come to publisher marketing. That just makes more sense for me and for what I need to get as a return on investment for my fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like people hardline on stuff like this so much, you know, it's like, I'm fully supportive of author publishing and author own works and IPs. And, you know, God bless y'all go out there and make your money. If you can make your money, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm supportive of traditional publishing. I'm supportive of authors like, uh, you know, um, who comes to mind? It's like a hybrid that does both. I'm, I'm supportive Ursula. of authors who do both. Ursula. There you go. Ursula is a fantastic example. Ursula is a huge, mainstream traditional success and has her own freaking empire putting out her own stuff. Like she's yeah. a shining example. Not everybody can be Ursula Vernon. Not everybody can do what Ursula Vernon does. Very no, Ursula's an outlier big time. Yeah. Big time. And like a great example for if you're going to do it, this is what you should shoot for quality wise and distribution wise and all the smart things that Ursula does. But like not everybody has that capability and, and they, and they certainly don't have Ursula's brand you know, or audience. Like that's yeah. the other part of it. So all these things need to be taken into consideration. We're talking about that. Cause like, that's an easy answer to the sort to the short fiction publishing, the short fiction question, right? It's like, well, forget about markets. Just put out your own short stories and see what happens. It's mm-hmm. like plenty of people, plenty of people do that. It's not that easy, you yeah. know, like building an audience and generating an audience and generating income or crew doing that is incredibly, incredibly difficult. So yeah. You know, it's not one, it's not, and I don't think it has to be one thing or the other. You know, that's certainly, that's certainly a thing that can and should be added to it. I mean, 
you know, that's that something a lot of us should probably be doing more of is having a bigger balance of stuff we control and release ourselves and stuff we put out traditionally. But I don't for just for my money, like I don't have the time to focus on it. And I certainly don't have the skill. I would have to involve so many other people to do it well. Yeah. You know, my problem is I'm not that. good at managing a bunch of other people. And so I'm I'm like the the idea of actually finding people to do the work is not the scary part. It's it's right. being the project manager of all of right. that. I've got yeah. ADHD. I can't I can't manage my day. So I can't manage <laughs> a whole bunch of other people and their deadlines and on my project. I just no. And uh yeah, no, that's it's a skill unto itself. Uh, and it's not one everybody possesses and it's not everyone it's not a skill everyone should have to possess to do this like we're writers like we should be able to write and then the people who are good at doing the things that aren't writing do those things like it's i don't think that's an unreasonable expectation or model to have it's just so deeply flawed in so many ways the way it currently exists i think we lose sight of that a lot of the times you know yeah um, but anyway, we're coming up on the hour here, so yeah. I think we need to start wrapping up. I don't, I hope we got to something meaningful there. I know we didn't provide, I don't, I don't think we had too many concrete solutions, but I hope we gave you something to chew on, something to think about. Yeah. Um, we did have one comment in chat and says my volume eight of the expanse is hardcover. So I, uh, uh, did not know they did that. So I'm clearly wrong on a couple of things. So mm. I guess orbit does do some, uh, hardcovers, uh, Thank they do a lot of, but they do a lot of paperback. Yeah, first edition. I have a lot. Of, I have a lot. Of, like Rage, like um, Evan Winters series. That's all been yeah. paperback. Yeah. So they do. They do do that. It's just not a blanket rule, I guess. And I mean, especially if you're the Expanse, I wouldn't be surprised if they re-release, you know, ninety hardback editions of all the Expanse books by now. Yeah, so that, I know great. they did this massive omnibus of the fifth season, but I don't know if that was hardcover or not. Yeah, so I don't know, but. Thank yeah. you for that comment, and thank you for keeping us factually somewhat accurate. We try. Yes. Um, so, uh, it's good to have you back, dude, and um, we'll have you back in two weeks. Yes, September, whatever. 20-something. 26th? 26th. That's, I have a deadline on the 26th, so that'll be perfect. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do that? No, if I'm not dude, if I'm not done by 9 a.m. on the 26th, then it's not done. Period. So it doesn't matter. But you'll get me like post post dead, like almost in deadline, but kind of post deadline. Okay, so, so I'll have to be, come up with the topic that day. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe you, you want to carry me a little bit. Yeah. There'll be there'll be one set of footprints in the sand. Yours. Your tiny foot. I, I got it. I got it. Thank as you. you. <laughs> as you carry me, which is no, uh, a I, hilarious visual, and I just can't get enough of it now that I've Hey, man, it. I've learned uh, that I can, I, I, I've been told that I can fireman carry anybody. I mean, we can put that to the test next time we're hanging out. I think everybody would like to see it, frankly. Um, but no. And in my head, like, I'm really demanding as a passenger. <laughs> Like, you're not doing a good enough job, like, keeping it level. Uh-huh, like yeah, yeah. Your shoulder's getting into my gut, man. It hurts. It's like, can we, can we go any faster here? Like, <laughs> I have things to do. This is very what funny to me. You're I don't... sinking into the sand. <laughs> Why are you an idiot and decided to wander around in the sand? Why are we in the sand? Why are we at a beach? I don't even like the beach. This is such a strange <laughs> scenario. Look at our choices. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm getting All sunburned. That. Thank you. Well, I'm wearing a big hat. I don't know about you, but I see myself wearing one of those big, oversized Stepford Wives beach hats. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. I like it. All right. Um, anyway, tell us where you're coming from, uh, Matt, and I'm going to start a raid to Cipher of Tear, my uh, stream team leader. Uh, she's doing some cyberpunk stuff, special event. So we're going to raid her. And uh, but let's talk about who you are and what you do, Matt. Those are very deep questions. I assume you I mean know. where people can find me online. You don't That's actually totally want to talk I mean. about the emotional journey I took to get here. <laughs> which will be a topic for another time. No, I'm most commonly found on the Twitters, which is a sad thing, and I really needed to fix that about my life. But uh, Twitter at Matt F and Wallace. You can find uh, me online at matt wallacecom I have many books out right now, Middle Grade Books for Kids, The Supervillain's Guide to Being a Fat Kid, Bump, my adult fantasy series, Savage Rebellion, all good stuff. You can find all that on my website. 
Also, something I want to plug is I have a I have a Void merch uh, collection. Oh, nice! Where I, par- I partnered with Void Merch to produce, uh, you know, really cool swag based on their original designs, based on the worlds of my fiction. So, if you like my Sindajour novellas that I did, you like my Savage Rebellion series, you like my kids' books, there's designs based on all of those things that they go on T-shirts, they go on mugs, they go on stickers. Awesome. They've got anything you could want to have those designs on swag wise. Um, go to my website, matt-wallace.com. Plenty of links to my collection from there. Support that. Void Merch is very cool. They partner with a lot of authors. It's a cool revenue stream for authors. It's something I'd like to see become more common and more prevalent. And uh, Send me I'm really, link and I'll know, put it in the show notes. I will do that. I will do that. But yeah, I mean, I'm really proud of the collection. They, they did a really great job on the designs and everything. So it's very cool. So check that out and support that uh, awesome. if you get a couple extra bucks. And I'm Merle Lafferty, Merverse.com, Station Eternity Live, October 1st, and the book comes out October 4th. This podcast was produced under Creative Commons Attribution, Non-Commercial, No Derivatives License. Music provided by Devo Spice, DevoSpice.com. Ditch Diggers! This is a free podcast brought to you by the kindness of our patrons. If you would like to also be kind and a patron, go to Patreon.com slash Mighty Murr.